I wanted to uh, welcome you all to our service this morning. Uh, it is, as someone said this morning, apparently this is, today is our early Easter cool down. So it, it got really chilly as compared to what it had been last week. So uh, I'm glad that you braved the cold and that you made it out today. So good that you're with us. I wanted to uh, go over some announcements with you this morning. Uh, we have a list of announcements, and then we have a couple that didn't make it onto the slides. Uh, they were handed to me this morning, but a few things coming up that I want to let you know about as well. Uh, the ones that are on the slides, let's start with those. Uh, Trail Life, American Heritage Girls, those are both very important ministries of our, of our local church. I uh, continue to pray for those two groups and for the leaders in those groups. Continue to pray about how God would have you involved in those groups and about how it is that he would have you serve. Uh, discipleship study is, of course, coming this Wednesday night. Uh, Zoom is available if, uh, if you request it. If you're unable to be here and you would still like to, to uh, catch up on what's going on, if you'd like to, to participate in what's going on, uh, talk to Sam and he can make sure that Zoom is set up and a part of the Wednesday night discipleship study. Uh, the Jonah movie, not the Veggie Tales thing, but the actual, although that's a really good movie, and if you get a chance to watch it, do so. But the production that was put on by uh, the group that has a, a place in Branson and also a place over in Philadelphia, and right now they're, they're Sight and Sound, thank you very much, Sight and Sound Theaters, uh, production of Jonah. Uh, we were given that as a, as a gift from, uh, from Bede Northcutt uh, several uh, probably about a year ago now, actually. And uh, one of Bede's great desires was to, for us to be able to have a movie night and to show any of those sight and sound movies. And so one of my favorites happens to be Jonah, so we're going to start with Jonah. Uh, movie night featuring uh, sight and sound theater's production of Jonah is going to be next Saturday night. Uh, originally, we talked about 7 o'clock, but it was kind of kicked around and six o'clock came out to be the better time for that to start. So six o'clock Saturday night, the uh, uh, membership team is organizing snacks and organizing uh, that kind of stuff. So you might be contacted by someone about what to bring, but six o'clock Saturday night here in, in our fellowship area. And uh, I'm looking very forward to this and looking for a, a great time of, uh, of fellowship and a great time of ministry also through this uh, through this great movie uh, women's retreats coming up april 21st through the 23rd at lakeview methodist conference center the cost is 130 dollars per person from what i understand uh, that's that's a, a really great facility and i'm looking forward to getting a report back from uh, the ladies who are going and uh, i am i have no doubt that it'll be a, a marvelous time for everyone to be able to uh, to go and to attend this General Conference is coming up May 4 through 6. Uh, the Port Natchez Church is hosting that. Uh, we have a delegate sign-up sheet. I know we hate sign-up sheets, but we have a delegate sign-up sheet. If you can go as a representative of our local church, you would be a voting delegate. That means that you would be, uh, that you're in good standing as a, as a member of our local church, that uh, you are a member of our local church and that you're 18 years of age or older. And so if you fit any of those qualifications, uh, you are welcome to come and to be a delegate for, uh, to represent our local church at General Conference down in Port Natchez. If you're planning on going and you fit those qualifications, please put your name down on the list uh, so that the Board of Stewards can approve that list of delegates at our next meeting in April. Now we're going to go off script. You can just leave that one up there, John. We have a few things coming up here that were handed to me this morning. First of all, uh, Tuesday, April the 4th at 6.30. Very special night for Linda. She is having uh, her, is it spring recital, senior recital? Gra okay, let's do that then. There you go. Uh, graduation recital. That's a, well, graduate recital. Grad we'll do that. Graduate recital. Uh, uh, we practiced this. Can you tell? We practiced this beforehand. Uh, the graduate recital uh, coming up on April the 4th at 6.30 p.m. in Waco Hall. If you can attend that, please put it on your calendars, and uh, we would love to have a good showing of folks from our church uh, to come and to, to cheer. Are we allowed to 
to like bring flags, air horns, the clapper things. Can we do that? We'll try it. What What's the worst they can do to us, right? Ban us from ever coming back again. <laughs> they have those those tubes. Woo, we can do that. We'll bring this. Anyway, uh, we are very excited for you. I'm very excited for the opportunity to not only hear you play, but to come and to be an encouragement to you as you play. So, Tuesday, April 4th at 6.30 for Linda's recital in Waco Hall. Uh, VBS planning meeting is coming up April the 13th. That's a Thursday night at 7 p.m. If you are involved in Vacation Bible School in any way, planning, teaching, any of those kinds of things, and you'd like to come to this meeting, is that an okay thing to say? All right, excellent, good. Uh, also, we planned this. Uh, April the 13th, Thursday night, 7 p.m., right here in our fellowship area uh, for planning for Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School, in case you're wondering, is scheduled for the last Saturday in June, June the 24th, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., once again down here at Robinson Primary, and once again working in conjunction with Cornerstone Church. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so we're very excited about having VBS again this year and the planning for that coming up on April the 13th. <clears throat> because we didn't get the women's group meeting uh, for yesterday on the slides in time uh, for last Sunday, Pam wanted me to let you know that the next women's group meeting has already been planned. The date is going to be Saturday, April the 15th at 9.30, right over here. I heard great things about yesterday's meeting. If you were able to be there, ladies, I have no doubt that it was a blessing to you. It, I, for everything that I heard was just a, a phenomenal report about the things that went on yesterday from, from uh, the food, especially Norma's little, little things that she brought, which she said, oh, it's so easy, you just follow the, and, and, yeah, right, Norma. So anyway, women's group, April the 15th, 9.30 a.m. Uh, we had discussion Wednesday night about our Easter lilies. I don't know why I'm doing this, because we don't have Easter lilies up here right now, but we will as Easter is just right around the corner. And as we have, uh, in so many years, we've purchased those Easter lilies, and then they've been available for whoever wanted to buy them afterward. Well, the thing is, we've had several years, the last couple of years, where we've had quite a bit of those left over, and we don't know what to do with them afterward. So this year, we're doing a very special thing. The youth are taking on the Easter lilies. And so the youth and, the, and our, our youth and children are going to be doing an Easter lily fundraiser sale. If you would like to buy one, maybe two Easter lilies, we can purchase those and they'll be here. If we only have one person buy an Easter lily, guess how many Easter, li Easter lilies we're going to have up here? One, exactly. If no one buys Easter lilies, guess how many Easter lilies we're going to have? Zero. If y'all buy 100 Easter lilies, I don't know where we're going to put them all, but we'll find room for them. So it will be... Not only the, the Easter Lily, but it will be used as a fundraiser. Any extra funds will be going to offset camp expenses uh, for, uh, for junior and senior camp kids this year. Uh, I've also been told, and this was a brand new one to me, uh, that on Sunday, this is, this is so far off in the distance that I don't even want to think about it. Sunday, May the 21st. That's uh, the, the next to the last Sunday. In, uh, in May is a graduation fiesta honoring our, our high school graduate this year, uh, which happens to be my son. How do y'all do this? <laughs> Seriously. Anyway, there you go. See Pam and Cam Pam or Cameron and Cameron if they want to, but one or the other for uh, any information regarding that. Now, our offering, still back in the back. We are still taking that up as in, in that way. Uh, thank you so much for your continued and ongoing support for not only the ministry of, uh, of our local church here, but the ways that this local church affects folks uh, for God's kingdom literally around the world. We have uh, missionaries who are supporting uh, all over the globe, but also uh, for local kinds of things, local kinds of things like the food pantry just right down the road. I didn't get a report this morning from John. Sorry, I don't have my phone on me. I left it. You want to grab a 
while John's getting a microphone to tell us about the food pantry yesterday, I'm going to stall. So from the food pantry to all of the other things that happen right here that, that our church is involved in, that would not be possible if it were not for your continued and faithful support. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we had uh, 228 uh, households with 896 individuals. There were 18 new families, new households, with 65 individuals. Wow. So for the first time, first time people who visited yesterday, there were 65 right, brand new people who visited yesterday. As uh, inflation continues to go up, as food prices continue to go up, uh, one of the things that our food pantry has, has been able to do is to help those families who are facing those struggles or a paycheck just doesn't stretch as far as it once did. And uh, in doing so, the food pantry has just literally become a lifesaver for some families. So what a blessing that is. Thank you for your continued support and for your ongoing prayers and, uh, and support for that ministry in particular. Uh, if you want to know what's going on around not only our local church but around our denomination, I encourage you and invite you to go to BethelMethodist.com. You'll find us at BethelMethodist.com slash Robinson. And uh, as I said, you can check on all of the other churches and see what's going on in those places also, BethelMethodist.com. So we begin our service this morning. We turn, first of all, to a responsive reading, Psalm 23. As we read through this, you'll notice the parts that are marked for me and the parts that are marked for you. So let's read together. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures. Leads me beside still waters, restores my life. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we read this very familiar passage of scripture, we remember all of the promises that are found in this. We recognize, Lord God, that as we go through this world, as we live in this world that has been twisted and scarred by sin, that there are those times of darkness, those, those places of darkness that we face. But we are reminded, Lord God, that even as you lead us through those places of darkness, you are with us. Your rod comforts us. Your staff protects us. Your light shines around us. Father, Help us today as we go through this service. Remind us today, Lord God, that you are indeed with us, that you have not left us alone, that you, Father, are providing all that we need in the darkest of times, in the, in the most difficult situations that we might face. We remember and we rejoice today that you are with us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning. Let's stand together and we'll sing Savior like a shepherd lead us and we'll go right into lead me Lord. Savior like a shepherd lead us much we need thy tender care in thy pleasant pastures feed us for our use, thy foes prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. We are thine, do not befriend us, be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. 
Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, has bought us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, now heard us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with Thy love our beings fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Give me, Lord, Lord, I will follow. Lead me, Lord, I will go. You have called me, I will answer. Lead me, Lord. First Samuel 16, 1 through 13. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehem, Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed, anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see it as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. <clears throat> so Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Let's sing, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. Hail 
to the Lord's anointed, great with his greater son. Till in the time appointed, his reign on earth begun. He comes to break abortion, to set the captives free. with super speedy to those who suffer wrong to help the poor and needy and bid the weak be strong to give them songs for sighing their darkness turned to light your golden dimmed and dying were precious in his sight he shall come down to showers upon the fruit earth and love joy hope like flowers spring in his path to birth to pour them on the mountains shall peace the heralds sing and righteousness in from hill to valley flow. Kings shall bow down before him and golden incense bring. All nations shall adore him, his praise all people sing. To him shall prayer unceasing and daily vows ascend. His kingdom shall increasing, a kingdom without end. For every foe victorious, he on the throne shall rest. From age to age more glorious, all blessings and all blessed. The tide of time shall never his covenant remove. His name shall stand before ever, his changeless name of love. Let's remain standing for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end. As we go to prayer this morning, we have a number of, of things, a couple of updates to, uh, uh, to bring to your attention. Uh, we've had uh, Lisa from our Port Natchez church on our prayer list for the last few weeks. Uh, she had a liver biopsy uh, due to some, some issues that were found in, uh, uh, it, during a blood test. Lisa found out she does not have cancer, which is definitely a praise. Uh, she has a condition which is serious, but is also very treatable. So we're glad for that and very glad that, uh, that the prognosis is good for Lisa. So we rejoice in, in that news and we're very, help, very hopeful for uh, her future recovery. We're also uh, this morning glad that, uh, that Fred is with us. I know that, that uh, Fred's health is kind of up and down, but he told me this morning that 
He had uh, a really rough day yesterday, so we are glad that you're having a good day today and that you're able to be with us. Uh, also last week, uh, we asked you to be in prayer for the Easterling family, uh, for Betty's uh, sister-in-law. Uh, we continue to remember that family. The funeral was this past week, and we uh, continue to pray for that family, especially for, uh, for Jonathan, uh, who is the son, grandson, thank you so much, sorry about that, who is, who is the grandson of the lady who passed away. So we'll certainly be praying for Jonathan specifically this morning. I know that we have many things that we came in here with, uh, struggles, concerns, anxieties, worries, fear, pain, doubt. All of these things creep up in the middle of the week as we are going through the week that's before us from Sunday to Sunday. I heard a pastor say one time that we do all of the the spiritual things and all of the holy things here in the sanctuary. He said, but the reality is God goes with us out of the sanctuary because life is lived out outside of the four walls of this building. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. We need to, to remember again that as life is being lived out, no matter where we are, who we're with, that God is calling us to continue to walk, to remember that everything that we do, every moment, every heartbeat is an act of worship back to God. And so this morning, as we come to this place, as we come to this time of prayer, we are remembering that very thing. Every moment, every breath, every heartbeat is an act of worship toward God who has saved us through Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, this morning, thank you, first of all. Thank you for your faithfulness to be present, as you've said to your, to your people, that where we are gathered, where two or more are gathered in your name, you are with us. And so, first of all, Father, we thank you for all of the ways that you keep your promise, and especially in this way, Lord God, that you have come among us. We thank you, Father, for the things that you have brought us through this past week, for those things that were mentioned, for, for Fred's health and for, uh, for Betty's family and the death of her sister-in-law. But, Father, more than that, the things that weren't mentioned, for the temptations that we faced this week, for the idea is sometimes that, that, that God lives in the church and, and we do our own thing once we get outside of the church. Father, forgive us for that. Forgive us for that attitude. If that temptation has crept into our life in any way, Lord God, may you shine your light upon it, expose that, that lie for what it is. And may we, Father, in all that we do, every moment, Every, every breath, may we recognize that it is a gift from you. And may we, Father, live in relationship with you and worship you with all that we are. We pray, Father, for these needs that we continue to have. We ask, Father, that you'll be with those who are sick today, that you, are, that you will be with those who are, who are hurting. We, we mentioned specifically, Father, this morning for, uh, for Jonathan, for, for the grandson of the lady who passed away last week and we pray father that you'll be with him in his pain and in his grief we pray father that you will continue to to work in his life draw him to yourself and help him lord god to see you at work in his life even in the midst of the darkness that he walks through we pray father for others we pray for sally for judy we pray father for uh for neil we ask lord that these who are going through these times of treatment and these times of of uh, uh that are causing so much damage in their bodies it, it seems like it seems like it's so much damage but father we trust that you are using these treatments to bring healing to their body and we ask father that you will continue to heal and to help and to restore in every single way physically emotionally spiritually mentally Father, this morning, another one that you just bring to mind is Kelly Spoon. We ask, Father, that you'll be with Kelly as she's going through cancer treatments. Many of us know her from years gone by. And we pray, Father, your, uh, your healing and your help, your blessing upon her today. Father, in all things, we are grateful. 
We are grateful for who you are. We are grateful, Lord God, for what you are doing in our lives. As we are responding to your voice, Father, you are working in us. Thank you for who you are. Hear us now as we join our hearts and our voices together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading from the Gospels this morning comes from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 9, starting in verse 1. This is, this is one of those stories in the Gospel of John where you have to, to know a little bit about what's going on in chapter 8 because it leads right into chapter 9, and then you really have to know what's going on in chapter 10 because the events of chapter 9 then lead right into the teaching section that Jesus has in chapter 10. But this morning as we pull out this, this passage, pull out these verses from John chapter 9, we recognize again God's power at work through Jesus to bring healing, to bring understanding about who he is and about God's work in this world, preparing us, preparing us for eternity with God. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated as sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. And the man said, I, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered, and he said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. Let's sing together one of our favorite songs, Amazing Grace. Stand as we sing. sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to feel. Grace, my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. The Lord has promised good to me, His word, my hope secures He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures through many dangers toils and snares I have already His grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright 
shining as the sun with no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And then you can be seated. This might just be a preacher thing. I don't know if everybody does this or not, but have you ever thought about which of Paul's letters is your favorite letter? Now, well, I guess that's just a preacher thing. Sorry. Huh? Romans. Romans, of course. Absolutely. I, I, in fact, maybe you like the tight-knit way that Romans is put together. Or maybe you prefer the passion that we find in the book of Galatians. Or <laughs> for some of us, it's the brevity of Philemon. Uh, probably most people would say they are moved by the joy that can be heard as they read through the book of Philippians, the letter of Philippians. Truly, God spoke in amazing ways through the pen of Paul. One of the most unique letters Paul wrote is going to be the letter that we're going to be focusing in on today. And that's the letter of the letter to the Ephesians, the book of Ephesians in our in our New Testament. This letter is not unique due to its content. In fact, we find many shared ideas between the book of Colossians and the book of Ephesians. But Ephesians is different because it doesn't seem to be a personal letter addressed to a specific church, answering issues found within that church's congregation. For this reason, and for many others, modern scholars think of Ephesians as a circular letter, which was delivered to each of the Christian congregations in a particular area. An interesting thing, uh, an interesting note that I found out this week about that idea, about it being a circular letter, was that there have been examples of a letter to the church in Laodicea that was found. Uh, We have no record of that. But it's possible that it's the same letter, the same content. Not much of the letter has been found. In fact, it was... uh, partly because it was found in the possession of a man named Marcion, who was labeled a heretic of the church, that uh, it was probably just dismissed outright. But more than likely, it was the same letter that we know as Ephesians that had just been sent also to the church in Laodicea. So there would be the body of the letter, and where it said, to whatever church, you would just fill in the name. Interesting idea. The idea is still with us. I don't know, this week I got something in the mail. That was simply addressed to occupant or our friend at, and then it had my address. Uh, You probably have received one of those two, and if you have, then you've received an example of a circular type letter. But don't think for a minute that Ephesians is as impersonal as the junk mail that we receive. The content of this letter, of this letter that we know as the book of Ephesians, is very important, and it lays out quite clearly God's activity of redeeming the world from sin through Jesus, God's gracious invitation to be restored to relationship with God, and also every believer's responsibility to walk with God and to be matured by God in the faith. These are important issues that apply to every follower of Jesus, no matter where or when that disciple lives. Our focus today is on a group of verses found in Ephesians chapter 5. We start in chap- in verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 5. Follow along with me. Paul writes these words, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. These verses, this section here, verse 8 through 13, 
these verses are important because they provide a positive side of how to live as children of the light, that phrase we found there in verse 8, and also as imitators of God, which is a phrase that Paul uses to describe Christians in verse 1. Now, verses 1 through 7 give what could be called the, the negative side of being imitators of God. These are the verses that tell us those attitudes and actions, there's six that are specifically mentioned there, to stay away from. It's the, it's the thou shalt not section of, uh, of that passage, if you want to think about it. And then this next, what we just read, is the positive side of that. It's the side that says, this, this is how you shall live. These are the things you should do. Even though this is a pretty short passage, uh, we're going to go through these verses a little more closely so that we can understand uh, more clearly how Paul's instructions for the church then affect our relationship with God still today. So let's start again. Let's look back again at verse 8, the first part of verse 8, where Paul writes this, You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. It, Paul starts off with the word for, and it refers us back to what came before those opening verses, or these, these words here in verse 8. So it forces us to look backward a little bit. And as we look backward, we find that Paul is talking about a contrast between darkness and light. This is a contrast that's found throughout the Scriptures in, in pretty much all of the Old Testament. In most of the New Testament, we find this contrast because it's an easy contrast for us to recognize, for us to understand. We know what it's like when the lights are on and we can see everything and it's, and it's easy to spot anything that might be in front of us tripping us up. We also know how dangerous it can be to walk through the house with all the lights turned off in the middle of the night. If your lights are off and, and you don't want to wake anybody up and you go walking through the house, it's very easy to trip over something that's laying on the floor. To suddenly remember, oh, I forgot to put my shoes away as you stumble over them. Or, oh, there's the dog who I couldn't see at all until she decided to run under my feet. These are all things, what's in the darkness is not revealed but what's in the light is revealed. And that spiritual as well as physical idea is very important throughout all of scriptures. This opening sentence reminds Paul's readers that we who follow Jesus have been changed by God from who we once were to who we are today. In Psalm 40, the writer of the psalm said it like this, He also brought me out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock. This is God's work in our lives. This is work that is meant for God's glory. Second section here, verses 8, the second part of verse 8, going into verse 10, says this. Walk as children of the light. If you were once in darkness, but now you are in the light, you are to walk, to live, as children of light, verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. While that first sentence there of this section speaks of initial spiritual change or conversion, as we often, as, as word that we often use, this next section here moves us toward the idea of the ongoing work of God. God's work of maturing us, of shaping our spiritual lives so that we are able to become a reflection of God's light, of God's truth, of God's holiness, of God's love to the world around us. These are the works that God does in us. This is not anything that comes out of ourselves. And that's often the issue that we have when we read these passages. We think, oh, well, there's a checklist that I have to do. I have to be righteous, and I have to be loving, and I have to do all these things. But what Paul is telling us here is this is the work that God does in us as we continue every day to walk with God, as we have come to God, as we've asked God to redeem us and forgive us of our sins. God restores us, and he brings us into relationship with himself. And so Paul uses those very familiar family-type words that we hear in most of Paul's letters. And he refers to us as children of light. 
children grow in relationship with their parents, just as we are meant to grow in relationship with God. Children mature in their understanding of life, just as God matures us. And God shows us the differences between a life that is lived in spiritual darkness versus a life that is lived to the glory of God, reflecting God's light everywhere that we go. God's ongoing work in us is described here as the work of producing fruit. Some of you are going, oh, we've heard this before. Yes, you have. For the last four weeks, we've been talking about this idea of God producing fruit in us. The spiritual fruit here reflects the difference of a life that is grounded in Jesus versus a life that is mired in sinfulness. As we mature, we continually discover actions and attitudes and activities which are pleasing to God, just as Paul refers to these fruits here of goodness and righteousness and truth. These Christ-like, Christ-centered attitudes are used by God to be a witness to others of God's grace and power. That way, those who remain in darkness can recognize the light, not to be shamed by the light, but to see that there is a better way to live, a way to live that brings glory to God, and not stumbling around in the darkness of sin and fear and pain that this life offers. So, why does God's action in our life produce fruits which contrast with the works of darkness? Because God desires for our behavior to be in line with our confession. What is our confession? Well, if we're walking with Christ, our confession is that I am Christian. I am a follower of Jesus. We recited together a confession of faith just a little while ago in our service. This confession reminds us of who we are. It links us back to others in our congregation, in our city, around the world, who today are making this same confession. We are followers of Christ. And it doesn't matter if that confession is being whispered in a house church somewhere that is where people are afraid that the government is going to come in and haul them away, or shouted from the top of the largest cathedral in town. It doesn't matter where the confession is being made. The fact is, God wants our confession, God wants our words that we speak to line up with the way that we live every single day. If our behavior is not different from those in darkness, then there is no evidence of God's work of cleansing and restoring being done in our lives. And if our words claim that we are children of light, but we live like sons of darkness, then our witness and our testimony about God's work in our life is a lie. This next section, starting in verse 11, says this, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light For whatever makes manifest is light. This verse has been understood by some to justify avoidance of people who they judge to be not of the light, but still in the darkness. And that might be because of where they grew up, might be because of how they look, might be because of how they talk. No matter what it is, there are those who use this verse to say, well, I don't have anything to do with those people because they're different from me. That's not at all what Paul's talking about here. In fact, Paul's point goes much deeper than this. With verse 11, Paul underlines his main point to these believers here in Ephesus and to us as we read this today. Living as children of light excludes us from participating in acts of spiritual darkness. It is these unfruitful works of darkness that we are told to avoid, not the people who are still trapped by sin and spiritual darkness. Avoid the acts, avoid the unfruitful works of spiritual darkness. Why? We just said it. Because that contradicts in our witness to others the work of God in our lives. 
we can be with those people who are still mired in sin and not act like or participate in the same works that those people participate in. When we were once in darkness, God's light exposed that darkness in our life. God's grace invited us out of the darkness of sin and into the light of a relationship with God. As we respond to God's grace and as we walk with God, God is maturing us as his children. In this relationship with God, the light of God's presence in our life is reflected in all we do and say and think. It is this reflected light of God that exposes the darkness in another person's life. But we are not then to become the judges who pass a sentence of condemnation on another person's life. God's exposure of darkness is with the desire to graciously bring another person, a person who is practicing these shameful acts, into relationship with God. God does this work. Our only requirement is to remain in relationship with God. J.B. Phillips translated the New Testament several decades ago. And I really like his translation of verse 13 because it describes very well the work that God's light does in the believer through the life of the believer. Phillips translated verse 11, or I'm sorry, verse 13 in this way. It is even possible, after all, it happened with you, for light to turn the thing it shines upon into light also. Now, if we had any physics professors with us this morning, I'm sure that there would be a point to be made from the physical properties of light about this. But in dealing with the spiritual properties, what Phillips has hit upon here is this very idea. Just as God's light once shone in our life, as we saw the witness of someone else, as we heard the testimony of someone else's life about God's saving acts, about God's gracious invitation. And we responded to God's word through the witness of someone else. God is now using us to shine God's light through us so that others might see God's work and be drawn to that. Verse 14 emphasizes this fact. And it reminds us again of the work that God is doing in our life and the power of God's light that shines through our life. Verse 14 says this. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. This is resurrection language. At the heart of the Christian message is the fact that God is offering spiritual life to humanity. God is shaping us into living examples of people whose lives, whose attitudes, whose actions are changed by the resurrection of Jesus. How we live, how we think, how we act, all the things that make up our lives are a reflection to others of God's presence at work in our lives. This is our identity in Christ. As God is reflected through us, the people we encounter every day will see that there is new life available for them as well if they will trust God and respond to God's offer of grace. Paul's mention in verse 9 of God's fruit produced in our lives should remind us again of the theme that we've had through this Lent season, the theme of the vine. I say Lent, but it's really throughout the entire year. It's when we are in relationship with Jesus, who is the vine, that God's power produces holy fruit in us who are described as the branches. Like the change made in us by the presence of God's light in our life, the fruit that God produces in our lives is the evidence of God's presence actively at work in us. God's presence which is redeeming and rescuing us from the darkness from the darkness and the power of sin's control. Before we wrap up these verses, it needs to be mentioned that most of what we know about Paul's ministry comes from Acts chapter 17. Uh, Paul's ministry in Ephesus, sorry, comes from Acts chapter 17. Paul's time in this important Roman city started off with 12 weeks of preaching in the Jewish synagogue. Paul must have struck a nerve because he was asked to leave the synagogue. 
there was enough interest in the message of Jesus that a space was rented for, for Paul to preach. And Paul preached openly, publicly, for almost two years. This was a great time of ministry for Paul, an amazing time of God being at work. In fact, Acts chapter 17 tells us that, that people took uh, parts of Paul's clothing, anything that Paul had worn or handkerchiefs that Paul had used. Uh, I can't imagine handkerchiefs that Paul used, but pieces of cloth that, that perhaps he had used or something like that. And they used those, and they could take that and, and touch someone else with it. And God's power through that object would set other people free from the power of darkness, could, could cast out demons, could bring healing to a person's life. One of my favorite stories in all of Acts is found in this section, and it's where a group of, of, uh, of, of people, probably a group of people who had heard Paul preach in the synagogue, a group of, of, uh, of, of Jewish teachers, goes into someone who is, to, to visit someone who is demon-possessed, and they decide they're going to try to cast out this demon. And the demon speaks through the person who he's possessing. And the demon says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but I don't know you. And the demon then, uh, through this other person, proceeds to, to, to beat up these folks. And the, the whole story there in Acts chapter 17 is rather humorous. But it's told in a humorous way to reflect an important and powerful point. That the light... God shining through our lives reveals God to those around us. If there is no light of God shining in our life, they won't know that we're any different from the darkness of those around us. Yes, this was a great time of ministry for Paul and for those who were with Paul, but as always happened, there were dark times just around the corner. These great times ended public riot. Many credible, credible biblical historians, in, including one of my favorite biblical historians, N.T. Wright, think that Paul spent time in prison in Ephesus, even though Luke doesn't specifically mention that account. Not only was Paul probably imprisoned, it seems from other letters that Paul was genuinely convinced that he would be executed while he was in prison in Ephesus. And while the events that took place in Ephesus in Acts chapter 17 don't directly affect the reading or the application of our text for this morning, here's what does. We must remember that whenever God's light, which is reflected through our lives, exposes and confronts the sinful darkness of this evil age, the darkness will push back. But we must not lose even though the powers of darkness push against the light of God, which is reflected through our life, the power of darkness is limited. And darkness will be ultimately defeated. Our power, God with us, is not defeated. God's light is overcoming the power of darkness in our lives and in our world today. As we sing our final song together this morning, Perhaps there's something that's been said, something that's, that you've read this morning or heard this morning that has touched a chord in you and exposed something. Perhaps God's light is shining upon some area of your life, an attitude, an action. If you would like to come this morning to these altars, these altars are always open for prayer. If you would like to come this morning and pray, I'd be happy to pray with you as we sing our final song. shine, build this land with the Father's glory, blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire, flow, river, flow, love the nations with grace and mercy, send forth your word, Lord, and let them The light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining.
Jesus, the light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth. You now bring us shine on. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze, to set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, come to your awesome presence. From the shadows to your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine shine fill the land with the father's glory blaze spirit blaze set our hearts on fire flow river flow flood the nations with grace and mercy send forth your word lord and let there be light As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Here and here may our lives tell your story. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. The Father's glory, blaze, spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let them. God, you have, you have stepped into our presence this morning, not because we have sung the right songs or done anything in the right way or jumped through the right hoops to appease you to do so, but because you are the God who loves us. You are the Holy One, the living God who invites us to walk with you, who desires to work in us, to shape us and to mold us in your image so that we reflect your glory your love to the world around us. Father, we are yours. Work in us. Father, the seeds that have been planted today through the reading of scripture, through the, the singing of songs, through the preaching of your word, the seeds that have been sown in our lives today by your Holy Spirit, we ask, Father, that you will protect those and that you will bring those seeds to life in us. May your fruit, may your fruit, Lord God, be a witness to those around us of your powerful presence at work in us. Thank you for who you are. Thank you, Father, that you send us out from this place with a message and that we go in the power of your light today and that your light, Lord God, is that which brings life. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for going with us. Thank you for the message that we have to proclaim to all that we come into contact with. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take my life and let be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in 
in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>